All right, Chair, you may begin. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. This meeting of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board will please come to order. Uh, Secretary, could you please take the roll? Sue Allberg, Jeff Ellen Bogan, Manoj Gangwa, Paige Lewis, Dan Olson, Robert Putham, Katja Stokely, and uh, Council Liaison Aaron Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a reminder to the public. Anyone wishing to speak during first call, public invited to be heard, which is item five on our agenda, or during final call, public invited to be heard, item eight, will need to watch the live stream of the meeting and watch for instructions on how to call in to provide comment at the appropriate times. Instructions are given during the meeting and displayed on the screen when it is time to call in to provide comments. Comments will be limited to three minutes per person and each speaker will be asked to state their name and address for the record prior to proceeding with their comments. Please remember to mute the live stream when you are called upon to speak. Thank you. Uh, before item number three, I just want to welcome Nikki Davidson, uh, who is our secretary this evening. She is a, a, a new administrator in the Parks and Rec uh, in Recreation, and uh, she'll be working with Veronica and Aurora. And so welcome, Nikki, and thank you very much. Thank you. I, item number three, approval of the agenda. Is there any discussion? Raise your hand if you have a discussion point. Seeing no discussion, I'll ask for a vote. All those in favor of approving the agenda, please indicate by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 The agenda is approved unanimously. Item number four, approval of the previous month's minutes. I'll give you a couple of minutes to look over those minutes and uh, indicate by raising your hand if you have any questions, concerns, or corrections. Okay, if everybody is happy with the minutes, um, I know it was a long time ago, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, ask you to vote to approve the minutes from March 9th. Uh, if you approve, please indicate by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. Aye. I wasn't there, so I assume I shouldn't vote. Okay. Um, Similarly, Dan abstains. Okay, Secretary, are you good with this vote? Yes, thank you. Very, very good. So the uh, previous month's minutes or the previous meeting's minutes are approved with two abstentions uh, due to absence. Uh, item number five, public invited to be heard. We will now take a four minute break to display the um, <clears throat> in the uh, instructions and uh, wait to see if any members of the public wish to join the meeting. You are free to mute and uh, turn off your cameras during this period.
Secretary, do we have any members of the public waiting to speak? Chair, not at this time. Thank you. Uh, a reminder that there will be a final call for public invited to be heard as agenda item number eight. Uh, we move on now to agenda item number six, new business modification to the open space disposition ordinance. Dan. Thank you. Um, and I greatly appreciate this opportunity and bringing you all together virtually. Um, this particular item um, will be going to council at their study session on July 7th. And in your packet, you should have a, um, a draft council communication that we've prepared for that meeting, as well as the um, disposition of open space ordinance that was passed in uh, 2011, as well as the modifications in your packet. Just um, a bit of brief history back in 2000, and 10 and 11, this board in particular with the assistance from our city attorneys spent numerous meetings discussing how and when we would dispose of open space for whatever purposes that would be. Um, there were quite a few uh, meetings with this board as well as city council to decipher and determine how and when we would dispose of open space um, for a, a variety of reasons. So as we were going through um, back in October, looking to sell the fee title of the Double Six Ranch to the Dochef Dairy, we were intending to uh, retain the conservation easement. Our city attorney's office, looking at this disposition, indicated that there was no way that we could separate the fee and the conservation easement based on the existing ordinance. Because I believe um, on your page, um, it looks like page 10 of 21, it indicates that in no event shall the sales price or the transfer costs be less than the original purchase price. That created a problem for us, especially when, um, again, there's elements associated with an open space property that we would like to dispose of. Um, in the draft council communication, I think there's a couple of examples. For instance, currently we own three water taps that are underutilized, or actually they're not being utilized at all on any of our properties. Those water taps value at $75,000 a piece and because the way this ordinance currently is written, we couldn't dispose of those for anything less than the original purchase price. Um, we're currently working on the newbie property, which has a total of four houses on it. Two of those we would like to carve off, sell those, take those, take those dollars and put those back into the open space program for future development or acquisition because of the way, according to the city attorneys, because of the way the original ordinance was drafted, we couldn't separate those out. So what we're doing, is, and I tried to highlight the elements associated in the original ordinance. And then you'll see on the draft where we made the modifications um, that have been included to include, um, let's say for instance, the sale on uh, page 12 of 21, to include the fair market value of the property's interest conveyed. And then additionally on page 13, the highlighted um, looks like uh, line three, where uh, two and three actually, where we're gonna promote the health and wellness, the safety and the general welfare for the residents of Longmont and we result in that benefit. So ultimately what I would like from the board tonight is, is a recommendation that we could take to council that you review this, you understand what's going on and what will actually happen by the modifications will allow us to pull out some of the rights as we acquired it that are not beneficial to the open space program so that we could either sell those or transfer those 
um, whatever has been deemed appropriate in order to do that. That's the only thing that we're changing in the ordinance. The disposition of open space goes to city council. City council decides whether it's appropriate or, or not at that point in time, refers it back to the parks and recreation advisory board for a public meeting that must take place within 90 days. After that recommendation, we go back to city council for the formal action by ordinance that has to be by a majority vote of council to move forward with that disposition. This recommendation and modification allows us to separate some of those property rights, whether it would be, you know, residential units, a water right, a mineral right, um, you know, the transfer of fee while we're retaining some of this to break that apart without having to pay or receive payment for what we originally paid for the entire property. With that, I'll certainly open it up to questions and, and address um, anything that might come up. Recognize Dan Olson. Uh, thanks, Dan. I have a question in, in your later update. So page 19 of 21 under open space, your update for the for this, it ties together. So um, in under two land acquisition, it's the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eighth line of page 19. It's open space has been completed. We will look at selling the fee to the double six ranch. I don't understand your use of the word fee a lot of the time, both in the ordinance and in this paragraph. How do you sell a fee? If somebody else is going to pay it for you? I don't get that. And Paige, maybe you maybe mentioned able. fee a couple of times. And Paige, you may be able to help me on this too, because I know that you understand this element. A fee is basically all of the development rights, all the rights that are associated with a particular property. That's the entire bundle of rights that are incorporated into that property. It comes with a, a fee. So what in it's this, got nothing to do with the way I use the word fee. Uh, you know, and, and it really does. Paige, I see your head. <laughs> and it really doesn't. You know, when we think of a fee, it's a it's a price for let's say a recreation class or something like that. Right. It's it's the it's the right your. It's the property right for you to develop, to modify, to use that land for whatever purpose you'd like it to be. So in, in, this first, in this particular situation, we will sell that fee to the Dochef Ranch for the double six ranch. What we will retain is the conservation easement which basically purchases or acquires and maintains the development rights so that the Dochef Dairy, the only thing they can do on that property is to, um, is for purposes of agricultural production. They'll likely raise hay and, and graze cattle on it, but we have retained the right in the conservation easement for any of the development. So, so they cannot separate it subdivide it, build apartments, do those kind of things. Their only intention is for agricultural purposes. So that's a component of what the whole package is. So if you look, again, I think in, um, in, on, the, on the back side of, of, the, of the draft communication on page six, it talks about these original acquisitions. We typically have a bundle of sticks, all of which have a purpose. Conservation easement is one of those. Mineral rights may be another stick. A water right is another stick. So what basically what we're doing here is we are retaining the development rights and the water rights, and we're giving, well, we're not giving, the, the Don't Chef Dairy is buying the agricultural purposes in the land, and we're retaining the development rights. So therefore, the entire whole package, now we're taking this stick out, which reduces that value. And this depends on indeed passing this new ordinance. 
Correct. Got it. So this is a concrete example of why we wanted or why city council and we may like to do this then, right? Absolutely. Okay, got it. Thank you. Sorry and to be so that, nitpicky. And the other examples that I had were those three water taps that are not being utilized on any of these properties. We've got, I know by working with the water district, they have buyers that want to, would love to buy these. $75,000 per water tap. If I had the ability by changing this ordinance, I could sell those, generate the $250,000, $275,000, roll that back into the open space fund and buy more land or further land development of our nature areas or open space properties. Recognize Rob Putnam. A wheat ridge in which a developer wanted a, a park, a city park to put in a development, uh, you know, some kind of commercial thing. Uh, think in terms of Spangler or Lou Miller Park or something like that. They offered land outside the city worth far more than the park. So, you know, in some sense, it was a good deal. It was a bad deal because the people there lost the park and they got land somewhere else, which is so far from where they were that essentially that park was gone. In general, I'm opposed to giving away or selling open space. They don't make any more. And uh, I'm very reluctant to let it go. Uh, on the other hand, I think reading ordinance uh, 2011, 10, uh, it seems that the council has control ultimately, which is good. It's not the, uh, not the uh, staff that has the control, it's ultimately the council. So in general, I, although theoretically opposed to giving away open space, I think this is a, a good alternative to giving the staff some leeway or some flexibility. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Rob. Any other uh, questions? Hey, Katja, Steve Ransweiler here. Um, Rob, just to clarify, Parkland and Open Space have different, um, oh, okay, sorry. Have different criteria for a parkland within the city to sell parkland has to go before a vote of the people, a vote of the Longmont community. So we can't just we can't sell land to a developer for parkland to make it outside of the city without a vote of the entire population of the city of Longmont. Disposition of open space is different than disposition of parkland. So just want to make sure you understood that. Thank you. Uh, recognize Dan Wolford. Sue, I'll get to you. And Robert, I want to just assure you that we are not giving this land away. Um, as you look at the ordinance on pages um, seven and eight, it talks about the intent of the open space program. And we certainly would expect um, the net value of everything. We certainly would look at if, if um, a developer were, were to give us land in exchange we would exchange that at a rate that would be to what we would be giving them as open space or greater only. So, um, and then anything of that value would then be put back into the open space program. So the intent of the disposition of open space is not to ever have a net loss of open space. It would always be for a positive. Uh, I want to thank Steve for clarifying the thing on the parks. I, I just use that as an example of trade, you know, how, how things, something worth more, a good deal. That's all. But I, I'm, I'm convinced it's a good idea that the ordinance is, is one that's needed. Thank you, Rob. Recognize Sue Alberg. Um, I'm sure this has been well thought out, but my one concern is, so you sell the rights to something to one person, what happens when they choose to sell it to another and another? Are there any kind of safeguards in there that 
the city still has some kind of uh, a, ability to review or or something? I'm just curious. Go ahead, Dan. Sue, typically, um, a, a good example of this would be the conservation easement that we would keep as we would sell double six ranch to the Doak Jeff Dairy. That conservation easement is in perpetuity. So no matter who owns that, we will retain the conservation values of that property. Um, certainly at any point in time in the conservation easements, um, there's a uh, section about notifications so that we know as they might be selling that property to yet a third person, that they are being notified, we're being notified, and we can reach out to that new buyer and assure them that we still have an interest in this land and property, and which has maybe a priority over what potential right they were thinking they were acquiring. So um, the conservation easement that we would be retaining there is in perpetuity. So if you sell off properties that you don't need, is there also some kind of safeguard so that that can't be developed inappropriately or fracking or just, I'm just trying to think of the future, like years down the road, is there, is it? In, in an example that we would do um, on the newbie property, we're looking to sell two of the residential lots. Mm -hmm. We would sell those residential lots. We would assure that um, we would retain a conservation easement on those lots, limit, limiting the size of those houses or development to either residential, a single residential use or an agricultural use, potentially um, limiting the size of that footprint um, and you know, assurance that um, in that conservation easement that that lot then again couldn't be subdivided and then redeveloped some other way. So again, we're looking at it from that perspective and trying to make certain that we have some level of control and understanding of how that's gonna be developed. Right, or many situations not developed. Recognize Paige Lewis. Go, go ahead, Paige. Okay, thanks. Um, I support the adjustment that you're making, but in reviewing the original ordinance, um, I had a few questions and just saw a couple areas where it could potentially be strengthened. And so I wondered in what context would we have an opportunity to potentially review that ordinance and make recommendations to strengthen it further? Um, I'm, uh, you see the draft of the um, ordinance here um, that, we'll, that we're intending to take to council on the 7th. If you have recommendations for- I'm talking about the original one. Sorry, the, the 2011. Yeah, yeah, so we're, my suggestion might be if you have suggestions that would strengthen the original one, we're already making this modification that I would think that, you know, certainly the board could uh, make further recommendations and then we could run those. If it passes the board, then we could make those recommendations to our city attorney and let them weigh in on um, whatever language the park board might agree on. But you're hoping to do this at an upcoming meeting, right? I don't necessarily want to complicate your ability to get this passed. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess, for, and from my perspective, um, we, we're modifying it once. Maybe down the road, we'll make a second amendment or a second modification, depending on uh, the level of complexity of what your language change might include. Uh, so Paige, would you like that to be added as an agenda item in a future PRAB meeting? Yeah, that would be great. I don't know that it would be um, anything super complex, but I think it's worth revisiting just to make sure because it's pretty important. But I really don't, I don't know that we have the time or if this is the best setting for us to talk about that. And I don't want to com complicate what they're trying to do because I support that, but I would be interested in discussing it at a future meeting. Okay, so Nikki, if you would please take a note uh, to add that as an agenda item for a future meeting, uh, possibly coordinating with Paige uh, on the best time to do that, the best month. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Dan on uh, on this? Um, Dan, I, I just want to ask sort of the, um, the the straw man question, which is, what was the advantage of uh, the original language and what would be the argument against making this change? I, I, I truly believe that this was a difference in language between two separate attorneys back in 2010 and 11 and um, a review of the current city attorney um, and the difference of interpretation. Um, I think all along, um, even when we acquired the double six ranch, it was included in the council's original communication that we had intended on retaining the conservation easement and selling the fee to the Dochef Dairy. Um, so I think it's a lot of this is just um, interpretation of, uh, of how the ordinance was written. Um, again, with this modification, with this current group of attorneys, it gives us the flexibility to dispose of elements of the open space program that are not being utilized or underutilized at this point. Thank you, Dan. Uh, any other questions from the board or comments from staff before I request a motion? Okay, I'm prepared to entertain a motion at this time. Please raise your hand if you would like to make that motion. Thank you, Paige, go ahead. I move that we support the proposed amendment to the ordinance on disposal of open space. Do I hear a second? You can indicate by raising your hand. Thank you, Sue Alberg has seconded. Okay, all those in favor of the motion? I, I'm sorry, just a moment. Nikki, did you get the motion? I did, yes. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Uh, we now move on to agenda item seven, six, the second agenda item six, uh, items from staff. Um, let's start with uh, Jeff, uh, oh. Did we, uh, did we? We skip yes. the ongoing tonight for the uh, sake of time. Okay, thank you. In that case, items from staff, Jeff Friesner, would you like to start? Sure. So one of the things that I'm sure everybody is wondering about is when will we, if ever, start opening uh, some of our facilities? So I wanted to do just a, a quick update on where we're at. Um, I would just remind everybody that opening, uh, reopening our facilities and activities has been somewhat of a moving target. Um, changes continue to happen on a regular basis. And uh, anything that I would say tonight is all in a proposal that is going to the uh, Herald's leadership team tomorrow and they could send us back to the drawing board or give us direction to move forward. A couple of things that for sure won't happen is uh, we will be canceling all special events through the end of July, except the fireworks. Uh, the fireworks is done by a group other than the city of Longmont and they are still very interested in doing that, but Rhythm on the River and the concert in Thompson Park will be um, canceled. That, that notice will go out to the public sometime uh, this week. Uh, athletic fields, uh, we have been given direction that the fields can open both for uh, practice and for games. Again, this is part of what the proposal that is going to uh, the leadership team tomorrow um, there are some requirements that uh, the, each user group, and I'm talking about baseball groups, softball groups, 
soccer, basketball, any any anyone that uses city facilities to offer their uh, programs, including those programs done by recreation, will have to follow guidelines that require only 25 players on a field at any one time. That number does not include the umpires or any coaches with uh, the youth sports programs. Uh, it has to take into account social distancing, the ability to be able to disinfect um, equipment that may be shared, dugouts, um, that sort of thing. With adult sports, the recommendation in the guidelines is that there are no spectators, that only the players would be at the complexes. And with uh, youth sports, only fit direct household, people living in this house, same household can sit next to each other, um, but everybody else needs to uh, be able to do the six foot social distancing. And, uh, and in, that, in those cases in, with spectators, they would need to also uh, wear masks. Uh, the order was changed. Uh, originally, we, th we thought that masks were going to be required at all times. And generally, with uh, the, the order that came out late on Thursday, it had an update that uh, masks are required or should be worn where feasible. So we are starting to, or uh, we have proposed that the recreation center uh, would open up uh, we're proposing next Monday, the 15th. Um, with that opening, we would uh, require everyone to do a pre-reservation for their spot to come into the facility. And they would have a time limit that they could be in there. We'd have exits mark, marked out where people can go in the front door. Everybody will be guided out in other doors to try to limit the number of of folks that are in, in the libraries uh, specifically. Mask would be required coming into the building, waiting at the front counter. People would be able to go in, work out without their mask, and then as they're leaving, uh, they would have to put the mask back on. Social distance uh, markers would be put on the floor. We'll have staff roving the building to help uh, monitor the social distancing. and. Uh, what we would do is we would have uh, the gym, track, and weight room would all be uh, outlined as one room. Up, you can have up to 50 people in that room at a time. We would, we would have uh, fitness classes in the studio or the fitness room. That number in there will probably be somewhere between 15 and 20 because of the size of the room. Uh, the pool, we'll start doing reservations for lap swimming. Uh, people will have one lap to themselves, again, with a timed amount of time that they could be there. After that time, they would uh, have to leave. We would not open the climbing wall, babysitting, the hot tub, steam room, or sauna at uh, during this first phase of, of opening. Centennial pool, or let me back up. Uh, locker rooms, and when I say locker rooms, I say that because it's all in the same room. Lockers cannot be used during with the current guidance. S only those that are using the swimming pool would be able to use the, the showers. Everyone else would be asked to come ready to work out and go home and, and change uh, uh, as needed. And, and we don't think that's going to be a, a big issue because we believe uh, the swimmers are often the, the bigger user of the uh, locker rooms, except in those cases where people are coming to work out in the morning and going directly to work or working out at lunchtime and going back to work. Uh, Centennial Pool would be opened for uh, lap swimming only to start with. Uh, once we had uh, worked through uh, the issues that that might bring, um, again, the locker rooms and changing areas would be uh, available, but we would uh, block off the lockers that they could not be used. Once we get past the initial 
I'm going to say three or four days, depending on how things have gone, we would then start opening up additional things, uh, such as open swims, uh, some modified swim lesson programs, and, uh, and then also we would certainly do uh, fitness classes in the water. Then this, the, the next item would be that we would look at or we've proposed that Sunset Pool would open two weeks from today on June 22nd. Uh, it would open up with reservation time, reserve times also, uh, one lap swimmer to a lane. But in that case, we would start doing open swim right away. And, and we would do it with a modified number where, again, by the guidance, we can have 50 people in the pool. We would probably do it with a modified number of maybe 20 to 30 to work out our guardings, uh, what we need to learn to keep people six foot away from each other in the water. And, uh, and so we believe that is doable, but it's gonna be a challenge because when you have young folks swimming, they don't always remember that uh, they need to stay away from each other. The Memorial Building has been open to childcare since uh, late March. We started off with child care for city employees, uh, children only. On May 26th, we, we moved to a, more of our summer day camp model. Uh, of course, that still is, is a modified format where uh, we have four groups of 10 kids uh, that are all in separate rooms. The requirement for our license is that those kids cannot commingle across rooms so that the 10 kids have to stay separate from the other 30 kids at all times. And of course there's modifications where it's not really a, a true day camp like we've done in the past because we really can't go on field trips. We haven't been able to go uh, swimming. We probably won't allow the day camp to go swimming until our numbers can, can go up to a, a larger number. General programmings will, will start taking place uh, as soon as our facilities are open. Um, we can have nine people in a class at a time with an instructor. So kind of a quick summary. Anybody have any questions or comments? Please raise your hand and I'll recognize you. Sue Alberg. Um, my major question, and I know it's been a stressful time in the, for the city, but how will you, how will you, um, how will a reservation system work that will be fair to people? Because you'll ha you'll have more people who want it than you'll be able to, you know, provide. And how will it, you know, you kind of spread it out? I guess is right. So what what people will do is go online to our rec track system. We are currently this week doing all the uh, different reservation setup that we need to do. People will also be limited to only two times per week so wow. that somebody's not coming in, you know, five, seven times a week. We're trying to limit it just to two at a maximum so that it provides as much opportunity for everyone as possible. So what about families? I mean, like when they're coming to the pool, this like two, two in the family or how will you? Well, families will be different. Right now when the rec center opens, it's only going to be for 16 and older based on the wow. things that we can do. Okay. Sunset is going to be a different thing where, where families will be able to register. So moms or dads could register for their two kids if they have them and, and mom and they could take the place of four people. But again, they could only do that two times per week uh, until our numbers get larger. And how far in advance will they get to register? Let's like, you know, that's an excellent question. We haven't, we didn't talk about that. I would say it's probably going to be about two weeks. Okay. Because otherwise someone like me, I'd go in and pick all my dates right in you know, at one time. So I'm just, yeah. 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 Right, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Jeff Ellenbogen. Will there be a way for people to do this if they don't have computers? If they do not have computers, they will be able to call into each one of the buildings 
and do the reservation over the phone. Manoj, did you have a question? Go ahead. So the athletic program, which uh, I am seeing uh, being allowed as 10 to 25 people, how is city is going to monitor it? Is it self, self guidance or city is going to monitor it? It, uh, the city is not going to monitor it unless we get complaints. Each group is going to be asked to provide guidelines to our staff that outline how you will monitor your program and follow the guidelines that uh, have been outlined. If there becomes re repeated offenses of, of your group or some other group, then the city would consider removing your opportunity or their opportunity to use the fields. It's the only way we can truly monitor this because we just don't have the resources to have somebody at all the parks and all the different uh, complexes. Makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Any other uh, questions for Jeff? Dan Olson, go ahead. Hi, Jeff, you know what I'm going to ask about, and that would be masters swimming in particular. Is that part of lap swimming or is that part of a recreational class? We believe it is a part of lap swimming and are working on a modification that would allow up to three swimmers in the water at a time. But that's going to be a challenge because not everybody can stop at the same end. So if you have three in each end, somebody's still swimming. And if you need to rest, people have to rest on the opposite ends. We you are meant three per lane. Is that what Yes, I sorry. Three, three per lane. Yes. Okay. And we're working that with the, uh, the different uh, swim clubs also. So that means starting next week and you have to make a reservation, et cetera. Okay. Yep. What about you folks sent out an email, uh, gosh, it's gotta be three, two months ago now about extending passes. Does that mean the time starts counting again or do folks say when they want us, you know, start again or any thought about how you've done that yet? Yeah, that, that's probably going to be the biggest challenges of opening back up and trying to find a way to do it where it's fair. And our proposal would be that passes would not be used to start with as we get open back up. We'd ask people to pay the, the daily admission. We will continue to extend the passes however many days it would be until we can fully open the rec center. And the challenge is, is because you have limits, because not all of the, the rec center are going to be open, we're trying to find a way that's the fairest to everybody because it, with our system, it's either all the passes are on or all of them are, are stopped. And I think this is going to be the biggest challenge that we have with, with reop starting to reopen is how we, because some people, I get it, we've been sitting on, on their passes and, and their money and they're, they're not want to get going to pay anything more. But because if you look at the bigger picture, it really is the fairest to all pass holders. I agree that the 20 punch thing is like paying that I get it. But if you have a quarterly or an annual pass, but yeah. you only get to use the facility once this week or twice, yeah. that's not what you paid for, right? Yeah. No, you're yeah. right. It's a, it's a can of worms. Yes, it is. Other questions for Jeff? One more. Tennis leagues. You mentioned sports teams and competition and stuff. The tennis is a special case because it's organized by either the USTA or the Colorado Tennis Association, and they do the scheduling and want to reserve court space in various places in town. So far, they're all sitting on their hands because all the jurisdictions have differing rules. Have you folks been approached yet, or is there any plan in the future you can share? So yes, we've been approached by everybody for multiple weeks with different questions all related to team sports. 
I believe that if we are given permission tomorrow to do the athletic fields like I described, I think that will include tennis courts that you will be able to uh, reserve them and do leagues. The guidance is very clear in that LTA in this, this instance, Lamont Tennis Association, they're going to have to come up with a way of how they're going to be uh, doing disinfecting, how they're gonna monitor the social distancing because the last thing that we can have happen is a group of 15 people show up at the Quail tennis courts ready for their turn to, to play tennis. So anything that LTA can do to stagger starts, um, to uh, help monitor those, those things will, will be good. It, but no tournaments whatsoever. The, the guidance is very clear that tournaments in any sense are not allowed at, at this point in time. So I think after tomorrow, if we get guidance, LTA or any tennis group will be able to start uh, making plans for their leagues to start. Sue Alberg. So just to clarify, so everyone who makes a reservation is also gonna be paying at the same time. That's part of the reservation system. Yes, yep. Preferences that we limit the amount of time people have to stand in line. All they'll do is we'll have a roster. You're, you're scheduled to come in at 10. Yep, Sue, you're good to go. You will be, your class will be in the studio or your, um, you're good to go into the swimming pool. Um, again, trying to not have uh, a great deal of exchange of, of money or running cards, uh, at least to start with. And like your silver sneakers clients, everyone is in the same boat, everyone pays, correct? Silver sneakers is, is a bit of a unique animal and we need to get guidance uh, from the leadership team of how we're going to uh, address programming for those that are 65 and older. The, the guidance that was given makes it very clear that it's recommended that those 65 and, and older uh, don't participate. If I use the opening of the golf courses as a, an example of that, 65 and older people are golfing and golfing on a regular basis on the golf courses. I don't see that there would be any way that staff or the city of Longmont could exclude somebody because of their age. I think we need to make sure we're doing a good job of education to let them know that we're disinfecting to the best, best of our ability, but there's really no guarantees that, um, you know, it only takes one person that could be um, infected with the virus that could, could spread it. So people uh, will be asked to sign waivers, I believe, that will also acknowledge that uh, they understand the risks of going to a public facility uh, in a time of uh, COVID. Um, when you uh, have people coming into the rec centers and whatnot, of course, you'll have uh, a, a, a track of who, who all has been there. But for the other organizations, are they being required to keep logs uh, for future contact tracing? Yes, that is specifically that the sports teams have to have a roster so that if there is an outbreak, they can tie it to uh, the league, the game, and who else was playing that evening. Dan Olson. Uh, following on Sue's question about silver sneakers, that also, are you implying that those folks would have to pay an individual? Because normally the silver sneakers folks have basically an unlimited pass forever. Right. Um, we would, we still are working with silver sneakers on how that will work. My belief would be is that because it's a unique thing where silver sneakers do not pay that we would be reimbursed by uh, activity that we would probably not charge them that because we're getting money in a different venue. Uh, and so they, they would be allowed to do that in the, the we have the system already set up to 
track and bill that organization for their use. Okay, thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, yeah. Continuing with items from staff, David Bell. Yes, it's good seeing everybody. Um, and uh, I just wanna thank everyone for the support on the open space disposition. I think Dan did a very good job on something that I think he was correct on. This was always the intent of this language. If you really think about what council has directed us to do, which was really to give or um, have someone acquire a conservation easement on our open space properties, the way, that interpretation would not allow it to happen. So again, I, I do really think this was just clarifying language to do something that was always the intent of our ability to do that sort of disposition for um, the purpose, especially of conservation easements. So thank you, Dan, and thank you everyone else for um, working through that. Um, the next piece I just like to kind of touch base on, and Jeff is going through right now, kind of this slowly easing into how you start opening things back up, which is definitely a challenge. Um, but from the beginning, the whole um, COVID stay at home, one of the things that I just want to say to this whole group, what a important piece of the city's assets we manage and take care of because when people were told to stay home, the one thing the governor said was we have a great outdoor activities, we have great trail systems, and believe me, people took that to heart and we saw increased uses at every one of our trailheads, at all of our parks, at all of our open spaces. People I don't think ever got out um, into a backcountry trail were at Button Rock, they were at Union, um, people that typically have been out at sporting events or taking um, family to brunch were the only place they had was our trails and open spaces. So I think it was just a critical piece to people's physical health and mental health to have them getting out and using all these properties. So Longmont had just did a great job with over 100 miles of trail, 41 parks. People really used them to the full extent, I believe. With that said, they are still using them. They are still loving them. And we are um, now getting the push like Jeff did to start increasing the use of the facilities within the park. So as Jeff's going through this right now, he helped me quite a bit as we moved through. How do we then, the first thing we opened up was were the tennis courts. So tennis courts were opened up first, allowing for tennis and pickleball. We were then able to open up basketball courts, volleyball courts, and, and skate parks. And all those came with some challenges. You know, it literally was pushing some of that burden back on the public to say, if you're going to use them, we're not going to be the people that are checking to see if you're from the same household or if there's more than 10. So we're going to put a lot of burden back on you. And the only thing we can really do to leverage that is take something away. And you saw that at Union Reservoir, we could not maintain social distancing at Union and we we took away the ability to have the swim beach open because we just could not manage that. So I think starting out strong and saying we mean this um, was important because we did the same thing with the skate parks and said, we will take this away. And I think we've seen a much better compliance now that we've done that. Um, the next piece that just happened today um, was the were the playgrounds. So playgrounds again are under the uh, governor's orders. We can open playgrounds and our shelters. And we have really just told the public through signage, social media, that the city doesn't have the budget or the staff to continue to clean that equipment. Um, so the, the responsibility is back on them if they want to use it and they um, feel that it needs to be cleaned, they have the responsibility to have their Clorox wipes and their hand sanitizers with them. So we've been constantly going through this process and we're just kind of coming out the other side of that, getting all the outdoor facilities open as Jeff's kind of moving into this phase. Um, but with that said, even with those all those opportunities out there now, um, Union Reservoir, we have, again, trying to say compliance with reducing number so people in a certain area, um, trying to reduce staff's contact with people and the public's contact. We're limiting the number of cars to about 135 cars coming in and is still just a very busy place with the swim beach being closed. People are still running paddle boards. Um, the boat rentals are up. The um, Fishing is up, everyone's having a great time out there, but we are still backing people up to County Line Road as people wait um, to have one car leave and one car go in. So I think this is becoming a common feeling for people. You wait for a reservation in a restaurant, you know, wait to get into Union. They are, they're just showing up and, and using it. Again, as we scaled it up, trying to keep the, the pressure down, we, we really just did a single day pass only. We now have increased technology, which I was told we couldn't do for years. Now we have the ability to do um, online season passes. We've only done that for our Longmont residents, again, because we want to dampen um, the use that we know we're seeing from other places being closed. So I think that is going well for people. Button Rock, again, I saw it with, we just saw a whole different clientele up there as people got up into that area and really started experiencing and enjoying it. 
Um, we were seeing 100 to 100 plus vehicles illegally parked along the road that we're not allowing emergency vehicles in. Worked with Boulder County to get some additional parking signs up there. Um, worked with our public safety department. We now have two police officers up there. Worked with Timber Tossi's group to get some park staff up there to help with parking. I think it's been going really well, but um, I don't know if you saw, I think it was last weekend prior, we had a we had an emergency rescue up at Button Rock where we had to get emergency vehicles in through that access road on County Road 80 and back to the backside of the park where a woman had slipped and fell into the creek, got washed to the side and we had to get everyone up there. And again, I think just kind of working with our public safety officers, our staff who were able to, to do that and got everyone out there safely. And then the other place that's really seeing a big hiccup is McIntosh Lake. I think as people were looking for some place to go, um, kind of our little hidden gem in that community is no longer a hidden gem. And uh, I think as people start looking at, well, I can pay to go to Union or can go free at McIntosh. I just think this is going to be something that's going to be a continual challenge on how we start managing um, the number of users out there. And then finally, Steve's on here as well. The last place where we were just seeing that uptick that they saw in Boulder was the same sort of attraction as moving water in a creek through a town area. So Boulder shut down Boulder Creek up by Evan G. Fine. Um, I will tomorrow morning be closing one of the bridges at Dickens because it has been a, a jumping spot for um, young adults and adults. So we'll be closing that off tomorrow. Uh, we've tried signing it. Steve has been out there. Um, he's the one who brought this to our attention. So he made it my problem and Harold's problem. So it became Steve's problem after that. So he has been out. Um, signing that bridge and it kind of looks like those bridges in Paris with the little locks all over them but it's zip ties where, where Steve keeps hanging signs and they keep coming down so we just cannot manage it by working with people um, what was the last straw was Dale Rademacher's out there tonight with his daughter and he tries some people telling some people why they should not be jumping off this and he was basically told what to do um, several times and in several different ways and uh, he called me and said what do we do about this so it really is closing down that one bridge. I did talk to Steve and I think we can still keep good pedestrian use. The park is accessible. We don't have to take the extreme measure of closing down the park like they did at MG Fine. But um, I, I think one of the biggest challenges there is that water level fluctuates so much. And these kids are not gonna recognize when there's eight feet of water or there's four feet of water or two feet of water. So they just know they did it yesterday and that water can change in 24 hours when we change water levels at Button Rock. So um, that's kind of where we're at. Um, the big local parks are staying really busy. Our trails are staying busy, but again, I'm doing as much as I can to keep as much open as possible. Um, one, because I, I think our community just needs and depends on this. And two, the thing I'm working with other agencies is the minute one agency scales something back, it pushes that problem someplace else. So I think it's just, you know, part of being a good neighbor in our community is how do we all work together to, to, to solve this problem, this need from the community. So that, that's really my, my update at this point. And I do see some questions. Uh, Jeff? I, I was planning on bringing the bridge to the attention, so I'm glad that you already mentioned it. I'm curious, when you say close the bridge, I have done quite a bit of tub tubing up there. I'm curious, how is it going to work? Are you actually saying no bikes, no pedestrians, or? Correct. How, you, we, we how this, is the tube and then get back up to the top if that bridge is closed? So there might be a little bit of inconvenience there, but the, the way we did it, we had it, again, fortunately, we, We've learned through experience and down at Sandstone Ranch, when the trail was washed out, we had to figure out how to close that bridge off down there. And we learned a lot of ways you can't close a bridge off and people can get around it. But we finally figured out just by fencing it and using, I think, three padlocks per size, we can actually lock off that bridge um, that makes it really a challenge. And I think it's going to be a, a piece that if someone is seen on it, everyone's going to know they shouldn't be there because we did start seeing some Facebook posts that were telling people the city encouraged that, supported that, we made it safe, we dug that area out to make it safe. So this is gonna make sure people know this is not safe. There's the other bridge to the further to the west that will be the access point there. So if yeah, you're- walk, down far, the bit, walk farther up and then cross there where it's not- I see Steve wanted to jump in here and that's his park. So I'll let him talk about it a little bit. Steve Ransom. Oh, yeah, no, it's, yeah, Jeff. Um, yes, it would be a longer walk. And I really do think that people will come up to the location of this bridge and swim or walk across the river to get back to where they were coming from. Um, hearing from Ken Houston, our water resources manager today, I think the runoff is gonna decrease somewhat significantly in the past, next two or three weeks. So I think this is a problem that will go away, but we at parks and water resources and fire and everybody else need to plan accordingly for next year. So I think 
This is the first I've heard about the bridge closing. Is, is there a way to show that flow rate somehow? Because that was something I was looking for online. Like, it would be great to know how fast that's flowing from a science perspective, but also a safety perspective. Knowing there, is it safe to tube, is it safe to kayak, and also is it safe to cross? Th there are links on the city website as far as uh, the different, um, David, take it from here, the different. We have different gauging stations from basically Button Rock down through Lyons and Hygiene and, and Longmont that, that give some pretty good ideas what the flow are. But as um, Steve heard today, with all the ditches that can pull water off, it changes really quickly between head gates and stuff. So we can give a pretty good idea. And we'll work to see if we can get some of those links in a place that's more convenient for this group here. But um, it's, it's a good idea. But again, um, we're getting pretty close to filling button rock. So we scale back how much water is coming. We want to fill that up pretty quickly here. So all it takes is a turn a knob of button rock and that all changes pretty quickly too. So, um, but yes, we could we can try to get that, some of that gauge information from the state some places. But I mean, even under the bridge, it would be good. I know you don't want people to jump. I saw lots of people jump, but it'd be cool if there was a way to see, hey, it's two feet deep or it's five feet deep with like- a Oh, okay. So just like oh, a little, kind of little staff gauge sort of approach to what the level, we could probably work on something. You know. No, actually, I, I would disagree because no, you're right where that pool is, it changes. I, 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 I've talked to a lot of kids out there. I've been, ta I've been out there almost every day for a month. And I told them that I want to reopen Sunset Pool. So we have lifeguards to make sure there's nothing under the high dive. But things can move by the minute, by the hour, by the day. And we do not have, we're not, there's no lifeguards out there. There's nobody out there saying that it's safe to jump off the bridge. So we have taken the stance that it's not safe to jump off the bridge. And if you do so, um, yeah, you know, and David and I actually talked about how if you were on swim team as a kid, you could dive off the starting block and only get, you know, that deep sort of thing. It, it, it's just not safe to allow that to happen. So we're not allowing to. to I was happen. asking about the flow from a safety of watercraft more than jumping just to clarify. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So, yeah and that's where I think flow and depth can change too. So I, I think we, it's, it's something that we have a lot of questions about, but it's something we might be able to, I think fire and others have that same interest as far as, you know, volume and velocity versus depth, because Steve said depth can change, but velocities can pick up. So um, there's lots of pieces to that. Go ahead. I just have one other follow-up. The first of all, I wanted to say I've done the biking back and forth all the way on the Greenway, all the way out to Sandstone. It's amazing. I love it. Um, I've now floated all the way down to that next takeout. And I'm curious, there's nothing that says don't keep going. And I'm wondering, should there be advice that says stop or where can I go all the way to Mexico? Where, where does it go? <laughs> <laughs> it will actually get you to the state park. And I just talked to someone that just did it recently, but once you cross under 119th or 119th street, Boulder County has really said that's a natural area. They have they don't have a whole lot of interest in doing maintenance or making it more recreational. Um, I will just tell you that the the new director told me he does have an interest if we could find some time to start thinking about that because that really can get you up to the state park. And Dan Wolfer might talk to you a bit more. You got to hit this right when the water's right. If it's too high, it can be a little bit scary. If it's too low, you're pulling your craft through mud out in the uh, sandstone ranch area. So. Um, that's where it gets you to eventually, is out to, uh, out to the state park. It's very nice. Thank you. And I can tell you, Jeff, that I'm actually um, meeting the sign designer on site tomorrow to come up with a series of signs that will make the uh, boating and tubing portion of this safer. Great. Including that one. Great. Thank you. It's awesome. We love it. Any other questions for David? Yes, Paige. Mostly, I just wanted to say thank you. I've been thinking about all of you guys a lot during all of this, just knowing how much I have valued my neighborhood park and just access to parks and open space trails and, you know, how important they are, as you said early on, David, and like recognizing that those are getting a lot of pressure. I've been thinking about you guys, including the, the pressure of not being able to open the rec center and all of that. So I just appreciate all you do and hope you're hanging in there. Well, again, I thank you. And that's where I think this board is, is, is a great chance to see what a great asset you manage. Um, as we're saying, thank you. It couldn't have been done without, like I say, Jeff, Jeff has um, provided some of his staff to pro help out with the social distancing message in the parks. The PD has been involved. Timbers group has been involved. Boulder County and 
state for, I mean, we have all been working together to try to make sure we can buy people a place where they can get enjoy these areas without causing damage to our resource and also keeping people safe. So it's, it's been, it's been a big challenge, but it's been a bit, really been great to see people use it, enjoy it. Dan Olson. Hi, uh, David, I have a lot of questions or wonderments about uh, Macintosh. It's a park in my, close to my house. We go there, you know, all year and own the place in the winter. In the summer now, it turns out lots of people, as you said, it's changed forever. I think yes. lots of people are coming from out of town, et cetera, et cetera. Are you getting neighbor complaints? Lots of them. And I'm just going to tell you, trying to balance that with what, you know, I hate saying this when you're the neighbor there. And so first time you've seen this kind of increase, it's, it's kind of a new piece, but as someone that manages properties um, with lots of neighbors, lots of areas, whenever you start seeing a park pick up, the neighbors are always going to let you know, this is a change. It's, it's a big change for them. And we recognize that. And we, we appreciate how we can try to minimize that. But um, we just started talking about today as staff. I said, we have to start thinking about as we especially move into next year and we don't see people going back to doing the sports fields and the pools and the rec center, how we manage this because Union has a controlled entrance, Button Rock has a controlled entrance, Hall Ranch has a controlled entrance. This has such a porous entry system. Um, I can't even get my head around how you, how you start managing that. Um, part of it, as Dan said, is something that um, I think the city with all these great assets is going to continue to keep thinking about is it's our ranger program and how we start trying to talk to people and force the existing rules and regs but again for me right now dan it really is i go out there and look at busy and i would say that um i have staff members a little bit too and they, they say it's just horrible however i go out there and i see longmont community residents using facility that's paid for by their tax dollars they're doing it in a way that um, they're maintaining social distancing majority of the time and it's busy um, I haven't seen anything where it's been like the Union Swim Beach where I said, this is just uncontrollable and we're going to be the next outbreak of um, the coronavirus because we cannot manage this. I think once they get out on the water, I think once they get other areas that congregate people that it, they're, they're doing a fairly good job. That does not answer the questions of the neighbors and the trash or everything else we're dealing with out there, but we're, we're working on a, a long-term plan. This, I think what well, this has really done for us, if it's Button Rock, if it is Macintosh, if it's Union, it's given us a glimpse into what it would have looked like 10 years from now without this. It's things that as we see what population is doing along the front range, we're having to figure that out now. And I think some of the things we've done as far as online reservations, people just expecting you may have, you may not be able to go to swim beach without getting a reservation, um, how that's going to work. So Dan, if you have any thoughts or ideas, I'm, I'm all ears, but we are trying I to have figure some. So <laughs> there are lots of swimmers. And I know specifically that's supposed to not be allowed, right? Correct. Right. No, and that's the enforcement piece. How do we enforce yeah, the rules that, that we have? No, I understand. You make good points. And I don't, it's too late to put that genie back in the bottle. You know, I, I'm not complaining. I don't live right on the street. You know, I'm sure people who do live on the south side there are up disappointed that you can no longer park on the street if you're not there early enough in the morning. I mean, literally, it's parked on, on a Saturday or Sunday. There are no parking spaces. And people are, just, people are just cruising, looking for spots. So not only is Correct. it all the parking, it's the traffic of people looping, looking for spots. Right. But I worry about swimmers and the first time somebody drowns. Are we as a city or any way liable? So I think there's, there's a difference between, I think, liable. We have, we have governmental immunity. We have signage. We have things we're putting in place. We have rules and regs. I, I do think that... One of the questions I've raised because we don't allow body contact, but we allow paddle boarding. And we just know right. that as people have paddle boards, people are going to end up in the water. So we have been talking about this. And again, I, I think as we go forward, how Macintosh gets managed is something that we as an organization are going to have to figure out because I do think we have above and beyond just our legal liability, some obligations to our community and how we manage something that once we invite people onto that water, if we have people swimming there and there is no body contact, no um, watercraft contact. I'd push it back more on this is just irresponsible people. But when we right. invite people out onto a body of water, knowing that by choice or not choice, a lot of people just swim off their paddle boards. We know that too, um, that they're going to end up in the water. We have obligation. This last weekend, John Brim had to pull, they had 20 rescues out at Union. I know how it is in Longmont right now. The winds just picked up here. 
And when that happens, you can have serious issues with, with novices on um, watercraft, if that's a paddleboard or a kayak or canoe. So we're, we're definitely seeing that those are things I'm gonna have to think about how we start managing and budgeting for in the future. That was my next point was the wind just came up and I'm sure there were paddleboarders out on Macintosh going, what the heck? Anyway, right. you're right. Uh, whether that's patrols or rangers or I don't know what down the road, that's just, I'm glad you're thinking because that was me. That's basically the point I wanted to make uh, in the paper. I guess it was just a few days ago. They talked about the wildlife buoys and I've heard lots of people when I'm out on the lake, you know, you know, wanting to go over to that section or yelling at people for going over to that section. Is that going to happen? You think this summer or never? I will take the I will take the absolute heat for that one. Um, if you look at the governor's at home owner, the safe air home owner, the working it at out in the workplace orders, it really is that the goal is to maintain that six foot distance unless it's you're unable to do that for some reason. And in the city, we have work that requires people to violate that six feet. If we have a water main break and we have to get three guys down in a hole within three <laughs> feet of fine space, we have to get water to people. If we have a sewer line break, we have to provide that. Um, as I look at this in the way these buoys are put out, they're heavy anchors in large buoys. I need three guys in a boat wrapping their arms around this, basically face to face, breathing heavy on a warm day. And I've had Dan looking at the, uh, the area over there I can't say there's a have to at this point. I would okay. love to get out, Dan, and I've told Dan over and over, convince me I can do it in a way that doesn't jeopardize my staff safety as long as we're not seeing true irreversible impacts to wildlife. I'm sure there are probably being some shorebirds that are being scared away this year, but we're still seeing the pelicans, we're still seeing the blue herons, we're still seeing some of those, that wildlife that shows up there and we're seeing them in good numbers. If I had an endangered species that's being threatened, if I had something that was, I felt like, irreversibly damage that area, I would try to figure something else out. But at this point, I have told Dan, I don't want three people trying to spend a day out on a hot day in mass violating social distancing if we don't have to. No, that's fine. I was just curious. You know, I, I, I bow to your expertise. That's no, that's fine. okay. Dan has done additional, Dan's been out there. He's done additional signage. Um, I'm hoping we do the best we can do. I would love to see him out there too. Um, on a good year, when I have healthy staff, they're hard to get out. And this year, I just have not been convinced I have to do that yet. So I appreciate that, Dan. And the Jeff, last tip I could sorry. put in your online thing, but it's quicker this way. I was at car recently and I saw your update that it's basically done. The bathroom is still locked. I don't know if it's within the playground fencing, but anyway, you can't get in the bathroom. And the other night, Wednesday, last week, I guess, the sprinkler ran in one place for two plus hours. Uh, directly behind the tennis courts to so, the south. So just FYI. No, but two th I, I won't mind. I'm going to let Steve, maybe, I think Steve's probably calling Kathy right now. Um, Car, I don't have the answer for you. Kathy just gave an update on that today, and we're getting really close. I think she's saying it's punch list items, so it may yep. be that close. So I would expect those restrooms open soon. This okay. irrigation and sprinkler systems, though, we've had some challenges with dispatch. I'm not pointing fingers. There's new people. There's turnover. Um, when those things happen, we have an on-call person, and we should be able to address those, those issues pretty quickly with our on-call person. Um, however, at this point, people are being told when they call dispatch that there is no weekend help, there's no after-hours help. Um, so it's just a better job of internal communication, making sure that dispatch knows who to call. Um, and sometimes if it is two hours, it may not be worth it. We try to figure out. Okay. We had, we had a sprinkler system stay down for the whole weekend, and there's no way that should have happened. Um, dispatch should have got a hold of our on-call person and taken care of that. So we do have some work to do. Is Remind me, is there a way for folks, me in particular, to call or online email or something? Yeah, there's, there's non-emergent dispatch, and I'm spacing it right now. I bet Dan can look it up for me real quick, but there's there's not Dan. I oh, wasn't Dan Wolford's up there. He's, he's, but he's looking right now. There's, there's not an emergent dispatch and they are, they'll put you right in the same call call is emergent bill. They'll ask you this is emergency. So don't worry about calling them. That's what they're there for. And then they have the number for our on call people. So, um, okay. we'll get that to you here before the end of the meeting. Dan's got it right now. Go ahead, Dan. You're muted, Dan. David, I, I need that number too. No, here it is. Are you ready? It's 303. 
651-8501. I used it numerous times this weekend. Yeah, don't feel don't feel bad using it. That's what those operators are there for. They're going to ask for an emergency. You're going to say no. They'll put you on hold for a minute, and they'll get you in, and they'll get dispatched out appropriately. Is that for the weekend too? Yes. And so, I have a guys update now on car park. Yeah, yeah, Dan, I talked to Kathy. Um, Parks Operations has been trying to figure out the restroom while she's building the new playground. It's not related to the playground. We'll reach out to Parks Operations, make sure that gets open here this next week. And okay, thanks. And Just It was more of a pointer, not a whine. I'm not. No, whining. no, it's, it's good. It, that's that's why we need eyes on the community. We, Kathy appreciated that. You wanted me to put her on the phone right here to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to talk to her. And she's going to reach out to the operations folks about the irrigation thing. One thing I did want to say about what you guys were talking about earlier is that I think David and I both had an, an aha moment in the past 72 or 48 hours about, gee, unions closed. People are finding water at McIntosh and at Dickens and other areas. Are they going to go back to pay for it while it's free? And so we need to, we need to figure that out where we might have some reduced numbers at union and we might have some increased uses at those two places based on what people are, you know, figuring out as they go along. So that's, that's a concern of ours, but I hope at least at Union, or I'm sorry, at Dickens, that runoff is gonna decrease soon and the numbers will dwell, except for people wanting to float in the water to stay cool. And we can get till next April or May to figure it out. Okay, I'm gonna pause here for a minute to point out that it is uh, 10 of eight um, we do want to get uh, through the rest of the staff uh, items and then items for the board. So uh, just, uh, you know, don't want to cut off any important discussion or questioning, but just kind of a little, let's move along. Uh, are there any other questions for David Bell? Raise your hand. Jeff, go ahead. I'll be really quick. I'm just curious about the bridge one more time. Is the plan to permanently close the bridge or change the bridge? Because that's a nice way to bike. It would, it would be temporary. And I'm hoping that what we would get is, um, again, just like um, Union, people recognize that we're serious and we would open it. And um, this is what we did with the uh, skate parks too. We gave the Rangers and staff, Harold bumped that down to a staff decision. If we're seeing a problem, we will close it off again and send that message. But my goal would be to open that bridge back up. Once the water, like Steve said, once the water goes down and people recognize that it is no longer safe to jump there, um, Hopefully, we can get that opened up here soon. So, thank you. Okay, continuing items from staff, uh, Steve Ransweiler. Oh, do I have anything? Um, yeah. Do you have anything? Sure. Um, I have. <laughs> I have been graciously provided the opportunity to work with the neighbors in the Creekside neighborhood with the uh, the BMX course that has uh, been created in the repairing area along Left Hand Creek at Left Hand Creek Park. Um, I have person, well, not personally, but I have had contractors take these um, features down in past projects, but uh, with council direction, I will be looking to have some sort of a public meeting in the next 60 to 90 days I think we're going to go back to council first and get, let them know that our, our plan, what our plan is. But my really my plan is to just bring people out and say, hey, you can't build stuff in other people's property. We may need some sort of a bike skills course in this part of town. Um, we have $220,000 in the capital improvement program for the sisters property, which is just across 287 or Main Street to the east, um, southeast of the rec center for some sort of a, sort of a bike skills course. Uh, if we wanna repurpose some sort of property in the Cannon Meadow Park or the um, Left Hand Creek Park parcel, there's gonna be some sort of a public process that goes beyond just the BMX users and landowners and that sort of thing. 
Um, I look forward to trying to engage with those kids and the adults that support them. And we'll see where that goes this summer. Paige, go ahead. Can you please let us know if there's any kind of public meeting on that? Oh, most certainly. Uh, probably invite. I'd like to, to strongly support meeting. the value of healthy riparian areas. I mean, I also yes. like the idea of a bike skills course somewhere that's appropriate, but there I, I found the exchanges in the paper annoying. No, I, well, I, yeah, I, I get that. I find all sorts of exchanges in the paper annoying. So how about that? Um, Other uh, questions, comments for Steve? Steve, that good? Sure, I would just say that the intent is not to replace the BMX area in the riparian corridor. We will be re-improving this riparian corridor sometime from fall to early spring 2021. And whether we're building something else uber locally or somewhere in the area of Southern, Southeastern Longmont, it remains to be seen, but we'll build something out there. Thank you, Steve. Dan Wolford. Yeah, is uh, Jeff and David are working their tails off to get things open to the city and providing great recreation opportunities. I'm getting ready for the COVID cocktail, if, if you will. And that is where you take COVID-19 and you combine it with West Nile virus. So starting this Sunday, we'll be putting the, the mosquito traps out and starting surveillance for West Nile virus. And it'll be very interesting to see, you know, what kind of impacts we have. As I've talked with Boulder County Public Health, they initially indicated it had not a problem, you know, people are staying inside, so there won't have, be that interaction. Well, if we're not seeing that in the slightest. So um, I'm gearing up for that and certainly, um, you know, the public aspect of it and getting it out to the public so that we can uh, keep everyone safe from that perspective. But uh, be aware of that. Strongly recommend, you know, you probably heard me say it a bazillion times about the four Ds. You know, long sleeves and pants for your dress. Um, limit your activity in the evening hours, dusk to dawn. Um, reduce standing water in your yards. And certainly, I, will, I won't re recommend deep, but strongly recommend repellent. So be safe um, as we start gearing into mosquito control season. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Any questions, comments for Dan? Awesome, thanks. Uh, did I miss any staff? I don't think I did. Raise your hand if I missed you. Um, okay, uh, items from board. Uh, Council Liaison Rodriguez. Uh, mostly I wanna say that you guys ask a lot of great questions and help me answer questions. Uh, the vast majority have actually been about softball and baseball as far as how my email stream looks. Um, and so hearing what the guidance is on that is really helpful in answering those questions, as well as you know, hearing some about the, the sprinkler issue that I did receive some emails about that this weekend as well. Um, and that the folks did properly notify the non-emergency dispatch. And so that really is the best uh, avenue for them. Um, and again, uh, thank you so much for joining us these virtual meetings can be somewhat awkward in uh, the motions and votes and things like that as city council is very well aware of at this point. Um, so thank you guys for your patience with all that as well. And thank you so much to our staff as uh, following the guidance that's kind of put out uh, very quickly is, is hard to keep track of. I'm sure, uh, you know, watching the governor's press conferences and he says something and then watching how the various health departments deal with it is, has been very enlightening to say the least. So uh, just thank you to everybody involved tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, Member Rodriguez, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, um, whoever's moderating. Council Member Rodriguez and, and Dan, the sprinkler that's been going off, do you have any, is it near the playground, far from the playground? I'm trying to give Kathy some good information. I wasn't provided with specifics outside of the name of the park, which I believe was Blue Sky. Was that correct? Uh, that was, this was this was, that car was a separate park. one. That was a separate one. Yes, thank right, you. Yeah. The car park. Thanks. But Dan, the was it near park. the playground? 
the car park one I saw would be straight south of the western two tennis courts in the big open soccer-ish field. They ran for at least two and a half hours when we left the tennis court, only one of which has a net now. Uh, the sidewalk was flooded and it was starting to seep onto the tennis court. So I'm sure it's just one, you know, valve is stuck or the timer right. is so, off so or whatever. So straight south of the Western tennis courts. Correct. And there was probably, I want to say five or six jets on that cycle, something like that. Does that make sense? Yes. Rotors. Yes. Jets. Dan, Dan um, just because you commented on the missing net, now that we have 25 people in an outdoor space, we will be putting those other nets up. Oh, I meant to ask that. Thank you. Okay, continuing with items from board. Manoj? No, I don't have any, anything as of now. Thank you. Jeff? Um, uh, Paige? Yeah, I wondered when we might hear about any um, budget impacts to parks, recreation, open space as a result of just the overall COVID financial downturn. That's that's probably we'll we'll be glad to try to get that as soon as we can. But I, I was going to say it's it's an ongoing um, target because we're being asked to cut due to. Um, the impacts to our revenue stream from local businesses. At the same time, um, while we're being asked to cut, we're cleaning restrooms twice a day, which added $100,000 to our budget. I'm paying for weekend um, patrols out at um, Button Rock and other areas to Union to try to keep up with the social distancing piece. Um, we're adding hand sanitizers and stuff to our restrooms. So we're seeing an increase in our, my existing budget that's already been cut. So. Um, when I get my head around it, I'd be glad to give you an update as we move forward because I think it's an important piece. All the other piece is, is that if we continue to get the support we seem to be getting from the state, um, some of these costs may be um, reimbursable as well. Okay, it'd be good to have the same update from recreation too, just to hear overall. Yep, we will do that. You got good for you, Paige? Okay, Dan Olson. I'm good, thanks. Sue Alberg. Just also want to thank Park and Rec. Um, I think you've done a great job. And because I can swim, sadly, I've been on my bike all over town. And I really am seeing people who I would say are, are people who haven't gotten out before. It's, I've been seeing a lot of families. Um, it's been really beautiful to see. Um, I hate to bring it up since I know there's going to be budget cuts, but I imagine we can't have a discussion this summer then about a possible recreational swimming pool facility um, for the future in Longmont. We have to table such a discussion like that. I, I think that's still on the agenda. Council had given us direction to do a public process. It's still our intention to do that. Um, we felt it'd be best when we can have people in the same room because we believe it'd be much easier than the Zoom type of meetings. Okay, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And uh, I personally was also glad to see the school district um, say that they were going to also build a pool. So I thought that was pretty interesting. No comments there. <laughs> That's Rob. it. Thank you, Sue. Rob? I know his tongue is bleeding right now. <laughs> Rob, do you have anything to share with us? You're muted. Oh, I know. I don't know if anything. There you to go. Say. You did it. You did it. Um, okay. And then I guess I just will uh, 
echo everybody else's uh, thanks uh, to the extremely hardworking staffs at, uh, at both parks and at recreation. And I also wanna thank um, all of the administrative support for making these meetings work. This is, uh, this is totally fun. Uh, we are now at agenda item number eight. This is, oh, sorry, Dan Olson, go ahead. While we're talking about meetings, is this the plan for next month or is there a plan? A meeting like this, we I don't have say, any idea. Uh, we have no idea. I would say that we would do it only if there was some action that the board needed to take, like, like this evening with the open space. Okay. I'll be traveling. I brought it up because I'll be traveling, but I can, I think I will have internet on this, whatever that Monday is, the 14th or 11th of July, whatever it was. Okay, I'll watch email. Sue? I should have said this before. So if that is the case, one thing that I really missed the past three months was that there wasn't communication, just a little bit of sharing with the board about things that are happening. If that, if so, if we aren't going to have meetings, I would appreciate, you know, even just these, the, the reports you do on a regular basis just being included because I felt, you know, my information came from the newspaper, which I don't think is, you know, a, a full source. Um, and I just would appreciate just a little more, um, you know, interaction um, as, a, as a board member, just a little more information, I should say. Yep, we will I make a commitment that. I agree that, with uh, that. That we will make sure that if nothing else, that we get a update for from David and from Recreation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, this is agenda item eight, final call, public invited to be heard. Um, Susan's going to put the instructions on the screen, and uh, we will take a four-minute pause and reconvene in four, well, we're not, not convening. Four minutes.
Chair, I'm not seeing anyone that has called in. Thank you very much. Uh, in that case, um, I am prepared to entertain a motion for adjournment. I motion to adjourn. Okay. The, uh, all those in favor of adjourning, please indicate by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Is that everybody? One, two. Okay. The motion passes unanimously. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you all for your support. <laughs>